Students, I think, would benefit from choosing SWAC because it gives them an opportunity to get involved at a more hands-on level earlier in their career. Students choosing to come to SWAC benefit from having opportunities at the freshman and sophomore level to get involved in research that can carry them forward in their career while still maintaining the same academic rigor as they would experience at, at a four-year institution. The day in the classroom in physics and engineering starts out as sort of a conversational approach to the material that we're looking at, whether it be solving rocket science problems, whether it be designing bridges, whether it be designing electrical circuit systems. It's usually a conversational approach that leads to a lot of questions. I always tell students if they're doing science well, they'll always leave science class with more questions than they got answers to begin with. And that's to drive the intellectual curiosity of the students. And that's what I try to do, making things as interactive as possible and letting them foster that curiosity and develop those critical thinking and teamwork skills that they need to succeed as they go forward. You're dealing with a class in physics that is typically between 10 and 20 students. That gives you plenty of time to interact, ask questions. You get more direct responses from the instructor. And SWAC being a small enough school, there are instructors that you will see a number of times. So you get to develop sort of a rapport with your instructors and truly do become more like mentors than they do become teachers. The biggest thing it brings is a sense of opportunity. It gives us a chance to revisit how our curriculum works. It gives us a chance to incorporate new ideas, new equipment, and it also provides the students with ample opportunity for new projects and new developments in terms of research. The physics and engineering programs at Southwestern are a great way to begin your journey in a professional STEM career. Welcome everybody to our first um, physics and astronomy um, lecture of the year 2022, the uh, third one of this academic year. Um, we are glad to have everybody here. Um, virtually this this month, we, we had originally hoped that perhaps we'd be able to do things in person, but given circumstances, we, we understand it's probably in the best interest of everybody to do to, to do it virtually at, at this time. We are happy you were able to tune in though. Uh, today we're going to um, explore a little bit about the, um, the craziness and creativity that goes into um, developing a satellite project at an educational institution. Um, but before we get into our, I guess, speaker, I do want to um, uh, give out some information and, and a few congratulatory um, statements. Um, we were proud over the last couple months to be able to report that our physics and our chemistry department have received a faculty research grant from Oregon uh, Space Grant Consortium to help uh, build our research infrastructure. And we will be working on, um, from the physics perspective, we'll be working on analyzing the uh, the ion content of the interplanetary um, interplanetary uh, space around around the Earth from pickup ions from anom anomalous cosmic rays and also interactions with the sun. We'll also be doing micrometeorite investigations and hunting, and we'll be doing searching for uh, asteroids through the Isaac program. Um, our chemistry department is actually currently working on developing um, liquid crystal uh, organic photovoltaic cells for potentially um, essentially foldable solar cells for uh, lightweight uh, solar arrays to go on uh, spacecraft. So, so these are all projects that are ongoing. Um, the my, myself in the physics department and Dr. Mike Springer in the chemistry department, along with um, the various students that are involved in our research group will definitely be uh, making progress with that research. And we look forward to sharing that at a later date. Uh, elsewhere in the department, we're working on uh, our annual Inventor uh, competition. Um, Myself and my collaborator, uh, Crystal Hopper, have been trying to get student teams of inventors to uh, put forth 
invention ideas for this year's competition. If you have an idea that you think would be a wonderful idea to put forward into the inventor competition and you like the idea of competing for thousands of dollars in uh, in cash and prizes in the in sort of the game show competition perspective, uh, please, please feel free to uh, send us your idea and send us your team. You can do that by uh, clicking on the Inventor logo in the um, uh, on the physics homepage at physics.socc.edu and uh, fill out the form and we will be in contact with you and we can help you build your prototype for the for the competition. Um, we will also in the coming months have our uh, student art exhibit from the uh, students that uh, participated last year, our uh, strategic initiatives project, which was an art exhibit based on our exploration of military involvement in scientific advancement um, is being curated by our collaborator, Crystal Hopper, and we will be uh, trying to host that in the new science building uh, as soon as possible. I'm hoping for sometime either late January or early February. We're still working out the logistics, but it will be sometime during this uh, during this term would be my hope. Um, so there's a lot going on, and if you want to stay involved in in those projects as well as find out more about our about our lecture series, you can always visit the 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 physics page at physics.socc.edu or visit our uh, Southwestern Oregon Physics and Engineering Facebook page where we update everything. Uh, I am pleased today to uh, invite back a colleague and a friend a friend of mine. Uh, Andrew Greenberg from Portland State University, the faculty mentor of the Portland State Aerospace Society and the faculty member responsible for keeping together an entire um, cadre of undergraduate students trying to construct Oregon's first uh, open source CubeSat um, and a number of projects um, attached to that. And Andrew will give us a little bit of a, a deeper dive into how the CubeSat came together, its current status, and uh, kind of the adventure that was getting to this point and going forward, looking at it from an educational and an engineering perspective. So without further ado, Andrew Greenberg. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hi, I'm Andrew Greenberg. <laughs> and I can, in fact, turn off the mute button when I want to. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I have a thousand slides. I'm going to run through a quick introduction to space and CubeSats, and then I'm going to go into what we're doing and why. And I hope to get questions and talk at the end. And even though I have a thousand slides, I hope to leave at least 10, 15 minutes to chat at the end. Uh, one thing you do need to know is that this is a huge project, and other people besides just folks at Portland State are working on this. So this is actually something that you could also get involved in if you are interested. All right, let me see if I could actually do this. All right, so we did something really dumb, which is that we decided that we would build our own CubeSat system uh, instead of buy one off the shelf. And I'm going to justify why, and we're going to talk about what we ended up building and then uh, what missions we've got. So uh, ORSAT is the name of the satellite. Uh, but first, let's go back to the beginning, because it's really important that everybody sort of understand stuff. And I know that I'm, I'm insulting your intelligence, but this is kind of fun. So if you don't know this, it's good. Uh, so the first thing is we're going to talk about space, right? So what's space? Uh, it turns out that there's no really good cutoff for space. 
Um, the uh, atmosphere kind of peters out around like 80, 90 kilometers, but it just, it really does keep on going. Um, all of our satellites will be uh, roughly uh, three or 400 kilometers and they will re-enter. They will burn back up after uh, four years or five years because of the atmosphere at four or 500 kilometers. So what's space? Well, it turns out we just call it 100 kilometers and we call it 100 kilometers because of this guy. Um, and uh, 5,000 bonus points if you go research why von Karman chose 100 kilometers. It's a super interesting reason, and uh, it involves airplanes and spacecraft. And that's all I'll say. So that, that's, a, that's a go homework assignment for you guys. So 100 kilometers is not very long. It's uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the edge of space is uh, drive to Seattle. Uh, you know, no, sorry, where am I going? I'm going from Portland down to like south of uh, Salem. Sorry, not even that. So it's like, it's next door. In fact, it's disturbingly, disturbingly close. When you actually look at the Earth, we should all be dead because the atmosphere is so thin compared to everything else. It's kind of amazing. We have a layer of pond scum that we breathe and that's it. Um, so when you're going to space, right, we're at the bottom of a gravity well. You go up and when, like throwing a ball up, if you throw a ball up, um, it comes back down, right? Well, if you throw a ball up to even the... Um, geosynchronous orbit, which is about 35,000 kilometers away, um, it turns out it will come back down. And that's because we're in this gravity well. And in order to stay in space, we have to do the same thing that those that the OMSI orbit table needs to do. We need to go around the planet. So we have to travel so quickly around the planet that we literally fall back to where we started before we hit the center of the Earth. So this is called Newton's cannon. He said, build a, on top of a large mountain, fire off a cannon. And if your cannonball goes fast enough, then it will literally go all the way around the earth and hit you in the back of the head at a certain velocity. And that's orbital velocities. And that's hard. So going up is not that hard. Like going into space, like even a small university group could get up into space. In fact, one has in, in Southern California. Our little group is trying to get one as well. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is this. It's going 8,000 meters per second or 70,000 miles per hour once you're up there. And it turns out at that speed, a single kilogram of like a Coke can, a single kilogram in orbit has the same as about eight kilograms of TNT, same energy. So you can take out a city block with a one kilogram Coke can in orbit. And that's why we need big rockets. And that's why it's hard and expensive and big. So, so once you're up there, right, you're whipping around the planet, there are certain zones that you should know about. The first is the low Earth orbit or LEO zone. And this is where most things hang out. Uh, the International Space Station, uh, where all of our satellites will go into LEO, um, and most of uh, manned spaceflight is all done here in LEO. MEO is where the GPS uh, uh, constellation is. There's a couple larger constellations, but when you talk about space junk, most of that stuff is all down in here. Zooming out just a little bit. So uh, here's a GPS constellation out at 20,000 kilometers. And this is actually, sorry, this goes to about 1,000 kilometers is what most people think of it. So we go up to the GPS at 20,000 kilometers and finally a very, very special orbit all the way out at 35,000 kilometers. And that's geosynchronous, right? So down here, we're whipping around the planet every 90 minutes. Here, the GPS satellites whip around a, about twice a day, three times a day, something like that. And at this magic number here, it takes one day to go around the planet. And so if you put your geosynchronous satellite over the United States, as the Earth rotates, that satellite goes around at the same speed. So it looks like it's hanging in the air. It's not. It's going around, but its orbital period is one day. And then here's another homework, uh, homework bonus question, which is, okay, so, so here's Leo down here. Here's a geosynchronous orbit. You go all the way out here, and we have another satellite. But we didn't build this one. This one's the moon. <laughs> and so the real question is, hey, if it takes geosynchronous one day all the way down here, what is the orbital period of the moon? Because it's got one. And you might never have thought about that, but how long does the moon take to orbit the Earth? So that's your second homework question. OK, <clears throat> we're going to talk about satellites. And we're going to talk about satellites in low Earth orbit. 
you should know that satellites are kind of broken into two parts. One is called the bus, like an electrical bus, if you will. Uh, and uh, that's the infrastructure. That's like batteries and solar power and radios and computers and rocket motors to, to control the satellite. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, your engine and brakes in the car. It's not very exciting, but you need them. The payload is the mission hardware. That's what you literally get paid to fly in your satellite. So everybody in the space world breaks it up into the bus and the payload. Um, and, you know, the payload is usually Earth imaging or for James Webb, it's the giant space telescope. Um, and so you'll hear bus and payload go back and forth. And I'll even talk about that for our little tiny satellites. So our satellites are small and they're all because of this guy. This guy is Bob Twiggs and holding it. He's holding a satellite in his hand and it's called a CubeSat. And a CubeSat is uh, a standard for satellite that's 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And then you can stack, and this is called one unit CubeSat. So the smallest CubeSat you can build is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter, so about four by four by four inch cube. You can stack those together and get a two U. You can stack three of those together and get a three U. So I can build one satellite that's a three U CubeSat. And now we have six and even more recently 12 U. But most of the satellite, most of the CubeSats in space right now are three U. So this is a specification, and for you mechanical uh, grease monkeys out there, uh, that comes with you know actual mechanical specifications. Uh, you can't go past 113.5 millimeters. Your um, uh, CubeSat must be 100.0 exactly. Um, and so there's all sorts of mechanical constraints to building a CubeSat, so it's an actual form factor. And these are some actual CubeSats. So here's a 1U uh, CubeSat, a 2U, a 3U, and a 6U. So just like a larger satellite, a CubeSat has got every single part that you need. It's got solar panels to generate power while it's in space. It's got a battery pack so that when you're behind the Earth and you can't see the sun, you can still power your satellite. It's got antennas and a radio so you can talk to the satellite. And then, of course, it's got the payload, whatever it is, uh, in this case, a spectrometer or uh, the Geiger counter, right? And so even our, our little tiny satellites are broken up into buses and payloads. So this is, these are my favorite slides about CubeSats. So a lot of people ask, um, what's so special about CubeSats? It's just like, is it like a shipping container? And it turns out it is like a shipping container because the you build your CubeSats, and then there are these standard shipping containers called P-Pods or uh, deployers. And you can fit either one 3U or three 1U satellites in these things and you close it up and then they kind of attach this to the bottom of the satellite. In fact, they put it in really, really terrible, awful places like next to the damn engines on your rocket. And then what happens is they, you know, they've got a primary payload. This thing is like, you know, a half a billion dollar communication satellite. And, and answer me this question, right? So would you let a bunch of undergraduates build something that's next to your half a billion dollar communication satellite? The answer is no. No, you wouldn't. And so that's why the boxes are important, because the boxes actually keep the shrapnel and explosions and fire of the undergraduate built CubeSats in a little box so that they release the, uh, the big satellites out first, and then they release out the little satellites and, and everyone's happy. So we're what's called all the secondary payload usually. Um, you can also huck these off the International Space Station. They have deployers off there. Uh, and uh, that's pretty great to see. Uh, one of our satellites actually will be going off the ISS. So a really interesting thing is this was all done for education, but the people in commerce and in companies realized, oh my God, this is a cheap and easy way to get CubeSats into space. This is a planet Dove satellite. It's an Earth imaging constellation with over 300, one, uh, sorry, three U satellites. And you can see the same thing here, right? They've got solar panels. This is a deployable solar panel. This is a, basically a telescope. This is an antenna. It's the, in this case, the payload is the, uh, the telescope looking down at the Earth and they image the Earth once a day. In fact, one of my other favorite pictures is this. Planet Labs makes so many CubeSats that they ran out of room. And so they started stacking their CubeSats waiting for launch. So this is like a pile of satellites waiting for launch, which I think is really pretty great. OK. Uh, oh, right, interplanetary. So it turns out the first of the uh, interplanetary CubeSats flew with, uh, uh, oh, 
Perseverance, thank you, uh, <laughs> the latest Mars mission. Uh, and these guys acted as uh, relay satellites. So that big weird thing that you see here, that's actually a antenna. It's called, well, this is the antenna down here. And this is a flat parabolic phased array passive dish, which is the coolest thing in the history of coolest things. Uh, and that's like, you know, your fourth homework, just go look up that, but that's like deep magic. So it's very cool. They had a six U cube set right here with deployable solar arrays and they relayed the, the entry, descent and landing from, I'm sorry, insight, it was insight, sorry. Uh, it says right there, uh, they uh, uh, did the entry, descent and landing from insight uh, through these satellites, which is really cool. Okay, so now you know about space, you know about CubeSats. So let me tell you a little bit about us. So we have an undergraduate and graduate student project. Uh, we have a phrase, I'm gonna say it really fast, extracurricular interdisciplinary team-based hands-on student aerospace project. Because <laughs> that's what we say that a lot, right? So it, it really is all of that. It's a volunteer, a bunch of volunteers, a bunch of students, this is not a class. Sometimes we sponsor capstones and sometimes we sponsor graduate students to write a thesis, but it's usually not a class. These are volunteers. Um, it's interdisciplinary. We have electrical engineers and computer science majors and uh, mechanical engineers and math and physics and marketing even, sometimes even psychology students. Anybody really ex uh, excited about space can come and hang out with us and help us with these, help with the marketing, help with the fundraising, help with the building of the satellites or the rockets or whatever you want to do. Um, we have always been something called open source. That means that we publish everything to the internet so other people can use the technologies that we develop. And we have we do crowdfunding. We, uh, we are really appreciative of the Oregon Space Grant Consortium. Uh, they uh, usually give us grants on a yearly basis. But besides OSGC and crowdfunding, we have no formal source. And it's going to sound like we know what we're doing. We have no idea what we're doing. This is the first satellite we built. We've done rockets for years, but this is the first satellite we're doing. And, you know, we, uh, we have no idea what's going to happen and, uh, in a month. In a month, we'll find out what happens. So these are some of our projects. Um, here's our group looking adorable. These are some of the rockets we built um, and launched in the past. We have a liquid fuel engine project. We do uh, this right here is an avionics system for an amateur rocket. And this is one of our amateur rockets lifting off from Central Oregon. So uh, we think we're cool. Uh, we threw, we flew inertial measurement units, accelerometers and gyroscopes before they were really a thing. Um, we flew Linux on a rocket. We were the first people to push Wi-Fi past Mach 1. We've done a lot of really silly stuff. And here in the video, you can see we are actually uh, controlling the roll of our amateur rocket. So we've got a little gyroscope and little fins that control the roll rate. So we've done some some baby steps in control theory uh, around our rockets. So what we realized is, hey, you know, we built this amateur uh, rocket avionics system that's got batteries and radios and inertial measurement units and all this stuff. It's it's kind of a cylindrical CubeSat. So we uh, wrote a proposal to NASA back in 2017, and shockingly enough, despite this phrase, uh, we got in and it was great. And so we proposed to NASA to build a satellite called ORSAT that I'll talk about later in the presentation. And what happened was we sat down and said, okay, we're gonna build a satellite that we proposed to NASA, but um, we have a problem. And the problem is if we really build this by buying stuff off the shelf, we know it's gonna work but we can't afford the $35,000 or for actually in our case, the $125,000 to buy this thing off the shelf. But we know it would work if we bought the, the COTS, commercial off the shelf stuff. The DIY, the do it yourself CubeSat is stupidly hard to do. You have to build everything yourself, the solar panels and the battery pack. Um, and it's gonna take years and you need teams of students and it's still going to be really expensive because you have to prototype everything and try it and test it and blah, blah, blah. And then that's just for development studies. So, so this is um, this is a terrible idea. So we looked around and we said, no, really, really, what if we could have anything that we wanted, what would we want? Well, we want a design that scales. We want a design that you, we could build a 1U CubeSat or a 3U CubeSat with. We want something that looks like a commercial off the shelf system. We want a solar panel that can work on everything and batteries that work on everything. So we only have to do this once. 
we of course want it open source. We want it scalable so we can do little tiny things like Arduinos and big things like Linux boxes. And this was the most important. We, we want it to be student friendly. So instead of buying something off the shelf and then not actually understanding how it works and just using it based on the manual, we really want people to understand what the heck is going on and how these systems work. So we want application programming interfaces. This is basically means a common interface for not only software, but for electrical and mechanical stuff. Uh, we want the, the subsystems to be swappable. Uh, we want documentation. We want to use regular open source tools that are free to get, blah, blah, blah. So uh, we, we went through this and then we realized, you know what? We got to do this ourselves. This doesn't, accept, this doesn't exist in the real world. So let's build it ourselves. What could possibly go wrong? Right. So thank you for the CubeSat launch initiative for being patient because this was back in 2017. And now you'll notice it's five years later and we're still not in space. Uh, we're about to be, but not that original one. So it's hugely expensive. We spent more than $75,000 on everything. Uh, and we've gone through generations of students that we have to you know, ramp up on and ramp down. And they, then they graduate. We tried and fail them, try and fail them, but they keep graduating. Uh, and then you know, we don't have all the experience that we need to do a really good job. We need thermal and fluids and RF and embedded systems and communications and digital signal processing and image processing and all of these really shockingly deep niches, niches, niches in uh, engineering and science. So, yep, did it anyway. So uh, this is what we built. This is um, the ORSAT CubeSat system. It is a card cage, which means there's a back plane. You see this purple back back there. That's a circuit board. And then these things are cards. And just like these 1970s computers, which you might have seen, these cards all pull out and plug in to that backplane. So the cool part here is that we can give a card to a student team. So we can say, hey, student team, go build us a star tracker that has a camera that looks at the star field and tells us which way the, the, the satellite's pointed. And they can do that. And if they don't succeed, then we don't put it in the satellite and the satellite still runs. <laughs> So uh, it was pretty great. So we really like the card cage idea. Um, it's it's really, again, this, it's really good for these subsystems. We've got common mechanical and electrical interfaces. It turns out that uh, commercial off the shelf CubeSats use something called PC-104. So it turns out that our little design is actually more dense than the standard CubeSat. So we can fit in about 40% more junk into our CubeSat than a regular one, which turned out to be really good. That was really useful. Um, and we've got about eight of these cards per one U. And so if you have a three U, you can get in about 24 cards. Um, and it's, it's okay. Uh, and uh, it's not as good as a custom stack up, but we don't want something that's custom for every satellite. We want something that we can reuse over and over again. And again, because the cards go in the X and Y direction here, it's hard for stuff to go up and down the stack. So that's a little hard. Okay. So this is ORSAT in CAD. So we've got a 1U, a 2U, and a 3U, and actually a 1.5U, which is something different, uh, uh, in CAD. You can see here it is with the, the plus X face off. So you can see all the cards here. You can see some antennas that deploy outwards here and here. We've got some lenses for cameras, et cetera, et cetera. You can see the solar panels on the outside to power it. So it's a CubeSat, and it's just an it's a open source standard for that. So I'm going to talk about cards. So here's a 1U that's been exploded out. We call these frames. Each frame is made out of these uh, uh, flat aluminum plates. The cards go in here and they attach to the back plane. We have solar modules. And then the, the top and bottom cards are special. They're called end cards. And then we have caps on the top, end caps. Plus, plus C is up, minus C is down, and then plus X is out front. So the structure is all 6061 aluminum. It's something that if you had a CNC router, uh, you could make on your CNC router. So the idea was that student teams should be able to make this themselves. Um, it's, it's a little complicated and it takes a while. So we also expect student teams to just order these. It turns out they're not that expensive to make, which is great. So you can get them made by a machine shop and they come in for one, it's a couple thousand dollars. But if you have 10 made, they're about $400 each, which is pretty great. 
Uh, and it's uh, they're all anodized black, and we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, here we go. So one one use about a thousand, and if you get down to about four hundred for about ten. Uh, everything's that we use uh, standardized fasteners, and there's two cool things that we can do. Uh, because we've anodized it, it turns out that anodization of aluminum is when you make a very, very thin aluminum oxide uh, coating. That turns out to be not electrically conductive, but it's still thermally conductive. So we can thermally tune everything to our frames. Um, and then uh, one thing, one really important part for us was that we had to go through vibration, and we also wanted this really good thermal performance. So we came up with this very, very clever card clamp idea that was done by a student actually where yes these uh, cards can just loosely slide in and out but when we're ready for flight or a vibration test we go ahead and screw in this funny looking shape right here this is, has a little angle here that pushes against this so as these screws pull this wedge closer and closer to the the inside of the satellite it pushes up on this triangular piece and that clamps the card and so this, these card clamps have a really, really, really good mechanical and thermal properties. Here's one that's actually been clamped. So we have vibration tested it, and, lo and in fact, to the vibration uh, envelope that is for uh, SpaceX Falcon 9. Works great. We've literally never had a problem with it. Uh, we've even gone 1.5 times over, and we just don't have a problem. Uh, I have dropped to the satellite once and still don't have a problem. So. I think maybe it's even overbuilt, which would be fine. Good for a student group. And again, I talked about this thermal modeling uh, and thermal tuning. So again, we can take this type 2 ionization and we can clamp this these gold edges. This is the ground plane of these uh, CubeSat, uh, sorry, these PCBs, circuit boards. And we can dump the heat from this chip out through here and then into the aluminum frame. Uh, we have drawings uh, for this according to ASME, so you, you can also uh, give these drawings to a machine shop, which they'll ask for because some of these tolerances are pretty tight. And we have this idea of lean manufacturing. So we have these kits. So not only do you make these things, but um, you these are all the fasteners you need to put it together. And here are the couple of tools you need from a master card to put them together. Here are the wedges, the triangles, and here are the frame, right? So sort of easy, smeezy, easy. It takes about an hour to put a satellite together which is not bad. Okay, so that was all the mechanical stuff. Let's talk about the actual bus now, the electrical bus in this case. So this is the back plane. You can see the car, the card connectors here. Each of these plugs into a card. These are radio frequency connectors. So for our antennas and radios, they plug into here. And then we have an auxiliary connector that you can use for whatever you need. Every satellite's different, and so we expect everybody to make a bespoke backplane, meaning that everybody will make a new backplane for their mission. Because again, it's not like you can't, you know, we, we, we're giving you all the CAD files for this, and so you can go modify the stuff yourself for your specific mission. So the power that we distribute here is 7.2 volts. Uh, we use something called the Controller Area Network, or CAN bus, that's used in cars to talk uh, back and forth between the cards. Um, and we have some other special stuff going on. So we use two types of circuit boards. We have a two-layer board that's super cheap and a four-layer board that we use when we're doing radio frequency stuff or really complicated electronics. And a shout out to Osh Park. Uh, why are all of our circuit boards purple? And that's because Osh Park boards are all purple and they've sponsored us and given us most, <laughs> most of our satellite. It turns out most of our satellites built out of their, <laughs> out of their circuit boards. Um, let's talk about the computers on insert in, inside the satellite. So we, we needed kind of three levels of, of computers. We needed really simple computers that, you know, uh, sophomore and juniors could program for the battery and the solar panels. And that's this, the Cortex-M0. It's kind of like an Arduino is what it's like, So uh, or a Teensy, if you know what that is. Then we needed a control uh microcontroller, something that could run the whole satellite. So this is a bit more beefy of a, of a microcontroller, and it runs our radios, and it runs the communications bus, and runs the whole satellite. And then for our imaging, where we're doing GPS, or Star Tracker, or our cameras, we really need a little tiny PC, and that's our Cortex-A8's running Linux. And the really nice part is, to get students on board, 
we really, really wanted to know, or sorry, we really, really wanted to have this idea of, you know, freshmen and sophomores can start with these very cheap $11 boards from DigiKey or Mouser, right? And once they're kind of up and running and they can blink LEDs and, and make speakers buzz, then we can give them a cheap proto card and they can start programming that and using that and getting used to the satellite. And then finally, they can graduate to an actual card where they're programming and, and running actual systems on the satellite. So there's this idea of development tools, kind of bringing onboarding people, right? Same thing with our software development. For $35, you can get a Pocket Beagle, which is kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but smaller. And that turns out to be the same chip that we use here on our larger board. So once you get up and running, running Linux here, you can run it here as well. Uh, every card has a debug port. That's what these little white things are here. So you can program and talk to each card independently. That way you don't have to remove them to work on them, which is really, really nice. And one of the things when you start talking about giant systems like a CubeSat, it's really important to have a test and integration setup, something that you can work on, hack on, take apart, probe with an oscilloscope, hack traces, all that kind of stuff. So this is what we call flat sat. It's literally a 1U cube sat, a 1U or sat that spread it flat on the table. And so you, the ribbon cable takes the place of the back plane. Here you can see the star tracker and our C3 board and blah, 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 and our battery pack. And that way we can do programming. And each of these actually are, is an interface that goes to a single Linux computer that students can remote into and do programming and testing and debugging remotely, which is really nice. So I talked a little bit about CAN, the controller area network. We use something on top of CAN called CAN Open. Um, I won't go into it, but just know that it's sort of a, it's an industrial control system. So if you were in a factory, you might actually uh, have a CAN Open system. And we use it because it kind of defines all the messages on it. So, okay, so that's that's kind of ORSAT, the bus. Let me talk about the specific cards for a little while. So uh, the first thing is we've got to talk to the damn thing, right? And it's in space. And so we need uh, really good antennas. So we have this uh, antenna system that you can see here. It, you might notice that that looks a lot like a quarter inch wide tape measure. And that's because it is. It is literally a tape measure that is the cheap, cheap, cheapest tape measure we could find with the cheapest steel, because we really wanted bad steel, it turns out, uh, on Amazon. And we purchased it and cut it down. And this is three different bands. This is L1, uh, which is GPS. This is UHF at 400 megahertz. And L band, which is at 1.2 gigahertz. And so we've got three bands. And we've got four groups of these. And that makes what's, some, what's called a turnstile antenna, which is an omnidirectional antenna. So we're not controlling this satellite's uh, pointing or orientation. And so we need our uh, antenna to work in whatever way possible. So it's omnidirectional. Now, the problem with having these antennas is you can't just put them out there. Remember, I showed you that drawing of the CubeSat where the one you looked like a little box. Well, when you're in the deployer, you can't have anything sticking out of that box. So that's what this is. This is that same antenna, uh, but all the little tape measures are curled up. And you can see this white stuff here that's monofilament nylon. That is literally fishing line. And that fishing line is keeping these doors closed and those tape measures spooled up. And that's a big power resistor. When we heat up that power resistor, it melts the nylon and then the antenna sprung out. So on the side of our satellite, we need solar panels. So we've got four solar panels on, on the vehicle. We have these very expensive cells made by Spectrolab. They're gallium arsenide, and they're triple junction, meaning they've got three solar cells built on top of each other. So they're actually 30% efficient, actually, I believe 32% efficient, which is pretty great. Uh, they charge our batteries and run everything when we're in the sun. And they're, again, to talk a lot about thermal stuff, because thermal control is really important. Solar cells don't like to get hot. And so we've directly coupled this whole thing to the frame so that we try and dump all the heat from the solar cells into the aluminum frame. And if, you, if you're really into solar panels, uh, you know about maximum power point tracking or MPPTs. We've got our own custom MPPT because we're cool kids. 
So obviously you're gonna go behind the earth occasionally, so you need a battery pack that will last. So this is uh, a simple lithium ion battery pack. You know those the cylindrical cells you've seen inside laptops or like you know hoverboards or anything else that uses lithium batteries. They're not, they're not the pouch batteries, but they're the cylindrical ones. And we've got four of them here in the battery pack. It makes about 7.2 volts. And we do all the things that you radio uh, control you know, drone or car or whatever people know about. We, we balance them and we have a fuel gauge and make sure we can't overcharge them and all that kind of stuff. So this is, this is the most important part of the satellite right here, besides the power. And that's the control system, the onboard computer. We call it the C3 for command, communications, and control. Uh, it has a big microcontroller and uh, it's got two different radios on it. It's got that UHF radio at 400 megahertz, the transmit and receive, and then an L band, which is receive only. So when we talk to this thing, we talk to it at 1.2 gigahertz and then we listen at 400 megahertz. And then it's also got some other stuff on it, which is pretty neat. Uh, we've got uh, 16 gigas of flash, so we can store data to down to the ground. And we have something called a watchdog. So when something, when cosmic rays hit our microcontroller and it locks up, this watchdog circuit will power cycle everything. I talked about this before. This is a star tracker. There's a little CMOS camera here, and that goes to this Linux box here. And it takes an image and compares and looks for little dots on the image, which are stars and then it compares it to a catalog of stars, and we can get down to, I think it's 0.1 degrees, we hope, of pointing determination based on the star tracker. And that's not really important for our, our first CubeSat, which is just gonna tumble in space, but we also get to take color pictures of the Earth and also to test out to see if the star tracker is even gonna work. We've built our own GPS system because we're nuts. Uh, it does have a commercial off-the-shelf GPS in it, but uh, we've got what's called a software defined radio GPS receiver. And there's really cool things you can do with that, that we will eventually do that um, in orbit. So not in a small one, but in a larger, like a two or three U, you sometimes need to point the satellite because you need to point the satellite at something like a target on the earth, or in our case, I'll talk a little, a little bit more later about clouds. Um, and so you, there's two ways to do that. In low Earth orbit, you're, turns out you're orbiting a giant magnet, right? The Earth has a magnetic field. That's why compasses work. And so it turns out if you make your own magnetic field using solenoids, and here are three different solenoids and three different axes, you can torque against the Earth's magnetic field, just like you, you know, an electromagnet will make a compass move. We can make the satellite move using these solenoids. So that's pretty great. So in low Earth orbit, we can slowly change the attitude of the satellite based on these magnet torpers. However, they're slow. And what would be nice is to be able to point it quickly. And so we also have something called reaction wheels. Reaction wheels are literally motors with weights on the end. And that's it. And we've got four of them. And by conservation of angular momentum, if you remember your physics class with uh, Aaron, uh, the when you spin up this motor, the satellite rotates around its center of uh, inertia or center of mass in the opposite direction, right? And so these four different reaction wheels actually allow us to quickly change the pointing of the satellite, which I'll tell you why we're going to do that later. So we're not done, right? So we just built this incredibly complicated satellite. You're all asleep now because I just went through all the technical detail of about half the stuff you need for the satellite. But you're not done because you need a ground station because on the ground, um, you know, your satellite's in space, you've got to talk to it. So we have our own ground station. Again, I talked, talked to you before about L-band, so 1.3 gigahertz going up, uh, uh, UHF going down. It's not very fast. It's certainly not as fast as Wi-Fi. Uh, but there's a whole amateur radio community that we're also broadcasting to. So it turns out that we're, we have a beacon, an a, a amateur radio packet beacon, that goes down to so that amateur uh, radio ham radio people can listen in. And if you are looking for a really cool project to do, do with your class, I love talking about SatNogs, the Satellite Network Open Ground Station. Just Google SatNogs, and it's an open source global ground station for amateur radio satellites. 
So every green dot you see here is somebody or some group that's built a ground station that looks a little bit like this. I mean, it's all open source and it's a couple hundred dollars. And that way you have uh, amateur radios satellites have global coverage of ground stations for free, which is pretty amazing. And we are super relying on it. <laughs> so, so go build them and tell all of your friends, especially in Central Africa and in Mongolia and Kazakhstan, that they also really need to build sat because we need more coverage in uh, Russia and uh, the, in Asia. So uh, the one problem with sat though, is that it's receive only. And so we need to talk to the satellite. So we are building our own ground station. And it's also open source. It's called the University Class Open Ground Station, or Uniclogs. Uh, it's expensive. So instead of a couple hundred dollars, it's 10,000 or more dollars. Actually, it's more like $15,000. And it uses software by radios. And it's got a bunch of bands. And it's totally professional. And it's great. And we don't expect many people to build this. But we have, a, we have University uh, uh, Maryland, Baltimore County, and University College London that are building these for us as well. So we'll have a small global ground station network. Here's the internal gut. So you see in this picture, there's a little box right down there. Um, inside that box are power amplifiers and Raspberry Pis and software defined radios and all the stuff. Oh, and we have the best patch ever for Uniclogs. Uh, Yes, that is a helical antenna, and it, the, it is wearing clocks. It's adorable. OK, so there we go. We are, we're, we're now, we've gone over what we've done in the last three years since we talked to you guys three years ago. We've, we've created an entire open source CubeSat. We've, got, we've created an entire open source ground station. Uh, we're, we're ready to go. So, so you ask, what are we doing? Well, <clears throat> things kind of exploded. We now have three missions. Uh, the first mission is ORSAT-0. It's Oregon's first satellite. Its entire job is to just work. It's got that bus on it, right? It's got the solar panels and the battery pack and the radios. All it needs to do is survive. <laughs> it needs to not catch fire in space, right? Uh, it's completely done. It's been handed off to spaceflight up in Seattle. Uh, unfortunately, well, I'll show you in a second. Anyway, it's scheduled for launch on February 20th out of Kodiak Island, Alaska. There's a new little teeny tiny rocket called uh, Rocket 3.3 from Astra, and it's going up to sun synchronous orbit. So we are 1.35 months away from uh, being in orbit, which is super exciting. Uh, on the bottom of ORSAT is this. This is actually a... Uh, <laughs> S band antenna for an experiment. And then there's this, uh, all the stuff. So thank you to Osh Park and Space Flight and Screaming Circuits and Crowd Supply and everybody else, Oregon Space Grant Consortium, who helped us get to this point because, oh my God, we needed the help. So that's the rocket we're taking. Uh, it's a teeny tiny little rocket that only basically takes about, I think, 150 kilograms, not a lot, to low Earth orbit. Uh, we are going on their third flight ever to orbit, so we are a little nervous, <laughs> but that's fine. So we, uh, so today's a sad day, uh, and today's a sad day because you might have seen in the news that Transporter 4, or sorry, Transporter 3 launched from Florida today, a SpaceX mission. On that mission was supposed to be Sherpa LTC-1, which was a big rideshare vehicle. We were supposed to be in here but they had a hydrogen peroxide fuel leak in here. And so they had to pull that, that whole giant rideshare vehicle off of SpaceX two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, we lost our ride and we cried a while. And then now we're scheduled for, uh, for Alaska. So, um, all right, so that's ORSAT zero that's built and ready to go and is, leave, is going uh, on February 20th. We have another mission, we're building a 1.5U CubeSat to test our attitude determination and control system. So this is going to test the um, star tracker and the GPS and the inertial measurement unit and the magnetometers and all that information going into our Linux box and being chomped on and then the magnetorquers and reaction wheels controlling the pointing of the satellite. Uh, that's being built right this very second. 
and its handoff is in late March, and we hope to launch in June. And we, we've got a free ride to space, but we're not allowed to say who it's from yet until until closer to launch, I guess. So that's too bad because we like them and, and we're happy that we got a free ride. And then finally, what used to be just called ORSAT, we're now calling ORSAT-1. This is that original NASA CubeSat launch initiative, the 2U. That we're going to hand off late this year, sometime in quarter four of this year, and we'll deploy off the International Space Station sometime in early 2023. So um, I'm going to wrap it up a little bit, uh, but I want last thing I want to talk about is, is the mission. So you notice I've talked a lot about the bus. So these two satellites, Orcsat 0 and Orcsat 0.5, these guys are about testing the bus and getting the satellite ready for this satellite. Because on this satellite, we've got two missions, two payloads. And they're both pretty cool, and we want them to work. So we want the, the uh, open source bus stuff to work first. So the first mission on that 2U CubeSat is something called the Cirrus Flux Camera. And its goal is to measure high altitude Cirrus clouds at about 12 kilometers and their global distribution. Turns out Cirrus clouds let visible light pass, but reflect IR light. And so they're really important for global climate models, but we don't have a lot of understanding about their global distribution. So we're making a shortwave infrared camera that looks down on clouds and attempts to pick, oh, I did, sorry, I didn't put the three bands in, that's hilarious, with three uh, shortwave infrared bands um, and tries to figure out where those high altitude cirrus clouds are on the planet. And luckily, we don't have to do so much of the science here because science is hard. Uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and University College London are two of our science partners. They're doing the, we're, we're collecting the data and then they're processing the data and helping us figure out how to build the science instrument, which is pretty cool. So that's one of the missions. Um, oh, I forgot, we flew uh, a prototype of the 2U CubeSat on a NASA high altitude balloon called the High Altitude Student Payload or HASP mission. So this is that uh, shortwave infrared camera. This is the 2U mock-up. Don't ignore this part up here. That's just a, a little periscope for something. And then there's, that's us, I think, right there on the gondola for the uh, balloon. And then they launched this balloon. This is giant. It's like the size of a football field. And that's the, that giant thing right there is that little thing right there. So uh, that was pretty cool. And we got some images back, I think. Yeah, excellent. Um, so these are some of the shortwave infrared pictures uh, the, you know, the, the gondola rocks, so it's kind of hard to track what's going on. But we have a couple hours of these shortwave infrared photos that we can now look for and, and do some testing for the cirrus clouds that we flew over for, for that. So that was pretty neat. Mission number two, and what I'll wrap up with, is called ORSAT Live. And ORSAT Live is where high school kids will build a uh, ground station and out of a kit uh, that's now coming together kind of slowly. <laughs> and that kit uh, will allow them to listen in on ORSAT. They'll tell us where they are in Oregon. Uh, we'll give them a pass when the, the satellite's passing over Oregon. We'll point the satellite at them, turn on a camera, and beam down a live video from space to them with a little laptop or a smartphone. And this is really cool because it's like a 400 kilometer selfie stick. They get to see where they are in the local, you know, local area around them. And they get to learn about satellites and orbits and communication and all that kind of stuff. So on board ORSAT, that looks like this big deployable helical antenna that needs to fit in this little teeny tiny space there and then kind of, just kind of spring out. Um, we have this cool little uh, schmidt cassegrain telescope that's about the size of your thumb. And then we actually use Wi-Fi, uh, 802.11b, for those who are you, of you who know that, um, to actually broadcast the live video from space. Um, that Schmidt Cassegrain telescope is super cool. It's really, really small. Here it is right here. And he, you can see it's testing it right here. Out there is a bridge with a sign on it. You can, can't really see it, but it's there. And this is what it looked like through the uh, telescope. So it's got a focal length of 155 millimeters inside a 30 millimeter lens, which is super cool. And in fact, there's a fantastic YouTube video from Huygens Optics 
uh, on the internet, it's on YouTube. You should go watch it. it they talk a lot about telescopes and how our, our Rick van der Horst from, uh, sorry, Rick der Horst from uh, the Netherlands hand ground this telescope for us, which is pretty cool. No, I, I won't play it. That, that's 10 minutes we don't have. On the ground system side, the kids will 3D print a little form. They'll wrap a helical antenna themselves. They'll have a circuit board from a kit, and they'll need a cell phone and a battery pack. And that makes it. We've tested this a little bit. It's not quite done yet, but it's getting there. We're trying the, here we're trying the antenna in an anechoic chamber. And we're doing this in partnership with Crowd Supply, which is a local Portland company. They are distributing the kits for us, which is really cool. And the money that we get from these kits will fund the STEM outreach in us giving these to high schools. So what does that look like, we hope? Well, this is what, if you had a cell phone on the International Space Station, which is about the orbit we'll be at, this is uh, Lapine right there. And then with ORSAT and the thing, the Schmidt Cassegrain Telescope, you'll be able to actually see this and what you can see right here is that little green splash right there, that's uh, Lapine High School. And so you can actually see fields, and that's, this is not even zoomed in. We can even zoom in further when you, if we expand the pixels. And so you can see that you'll be able to see your high school, you'll be able to see the, uh, you know, unless it's, of course, cloudy, <laughs> which in case you'll just see clouds, which a lot of schools will, sorry. But anyway, so it's kind of neat. You'll be able to see yourself live. And this is really neat. It's been crosswalk to uh, physics first and, and um, uh, or, uh, Oregon high school curriculum. And we like it. There's not a lot of space in Oregon yet. And so we like the fact that we're connecting uh, people directly to space with our own satellite. OK, <laughs> that's it. Um, this is contact information for us. Uh, we are at orgsat.org. We have GitHub, where all of our technical information has been published. All of our rocket stuff is at PDX Aerospace. And you can email us and contact us at aerospace at pdx.edu. And I'll uh, leave this up. And I'm sure um, you can ask Dr. Krenner for uh, uh, these links and if you didn't get them and uh, how to get in touch with us. So I think that's it. I think I, I, I sorry. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have left for questions, but I'm absolutely willing to answer questions. That's okay. That's okay. We do have we do have a little bit of time for questions, and I'm uh, I've there there are people listening that are currently typing questions. I had a couple that that came up for me, so I'll so I'll I'll do mine while I wait for everybody else to type theirs in. Uh, you mentioned the um, requirements for basically shake testing the CubeSat and making sure that you have the, the right launch parameters to make, to make sure that the thing's going to survive and not splinter into 5 billion pieces in, dur during launch. And it made me immediately go into flashbacks because when I was an undergrad at Tulsa, we did a getaway special project and we had to have things fit into a particular case that they could push exactly one button and the rest of the experiment had to work by itself. But then when we did the shake testing, it had to survive like 10 G's in any particular axis. So I was just curious what the parameters and stuff were for, for the CubeSat. <laughs> so uh, I have a video of it, but it's not a very good video because the, the shake table is on, it's got this giant mass and you basically cinch down this, your satellite to that and it shakes the living hell out of your satellite. It's the 10.5 G's in each axis for one minute. So you, you can touch the table while it's vibrating and your hand is just like, you know, like bouncing off of it. And like, you know, you can hear it that it takes like megawatt class power supplies to run. And so essentially it's a big subwoofer, right? It's a big electromagnet that's shaking this thing. It's crazy nuts. And you can't hear anything in the room when it's on. And yeah, um, you have to make sure stuff doesn't fall apart when, when you're shaking it. And again, 10.5 G's, our mass actually, so it goes above and below that. And they give you a spectral density. So you've got low frequency sometimes and high frequency sometimes and kind of randomly walks back and forth uh, along that. And then you have to, you know, Z axis, X axis, Y axis. And you just have to design it. You have to know if there's something, if there's a big capacitor, you gotta epoxy it down. It won't survive if you don't do that. Do you have a camera lens? 
it better be epoxy down or somehow fastened. Those clamps, uh, they're on three, for each of the cards, they're on three sides of the cards so that we really know that that thing is well clamped in. And so far, we've not had a problem with this. Um, we use relatively small components and we test before and after the vibration tests and so far, so good. That's a, it's always good when this, when the testing works out. Um, I guess two other questions from me. Um, so what led to the inspiration of let's build a, of, of let's build a CubeSat? I, I know you were, you've done rockets for years and then you get into, um, and then you got, you got into the CubeSat and I know, and I know it was like all the things that could possibly go wrong, but uh, but what led to the, let's write a proposal to say that we could do this so that we could get funding to try to send something into space. Uh, I blame Eric. It's all Eric's fault. So we, we were at a, a Oregon Space Grant Consortium uh, <laughs> workshop on CubeSats that was held at the Evergreen Aviation Museum back in 2015. Uh, and uh, I don't remember Eric's last name. Eric, who's a student, said, uh, oh my God, that was, and, and I, I taught a little bit there and, and we had people talk about stuff, it was really fun. And Eric said, hey, there's this thing called the NASA CubeSat Launch Initiative. They don't give you money, but they'll fly your CubeSat to space for free. And it's a whole, it's a whole like uh, thing, a whole program you go through. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. Let's, let's you know, we, we want to build the next generation avionics system for our rockets. And there's this CubeSat thing. So why don't we build a CubeSat that is both a, and generation avionics system for our rocket? And so essentially our next generation rocket, which we're going to fly this summer, is an Ethernet peripheral CubeSat, which is kind of funny. Uh, and so eventually the CubeSats will actually be running the rockets in the future. You know, we don't put the solar panels on because you, there's no sunlight inside the rocket, but the, the, all the stuff you need for a rocket, the, the inertial measurement unit and the GPS and the the, the radios, that's all in a CubeSat. And so, so yeah, so we decided to build a CubeSat for the rocket. And also, by the way, we'll, we'll go ahead and apply to this CubeSat launch initiative because they're not gonna let us in <coughs> because we've never done this before. <clears throat> and it's a really good training exercise for us and the students. And we can cut, I think a couple of years. <laughs> so yeah, we didn't actually expect to get in and they were really excited for us. And, and then we realized that we bit off way more than we could chew. And when we when we started actually building the system and understanding what's going on, you know, there's that famous story of, uh, I don't remember who it was, sorry. I, I think it was Kennedy, but I'm not sure where you, you throw the hat over the wall. And so you have to climb the wall. So the, the CSLI was kind of that for us. We, they, we got in and so now we have to build the damn thing. And uh, that it, it was just so much more than we ever thought. Yeah. Um, and I know one thing that we've, we've talked about in, in individual classes, uh, that I've had you talk about, talk to before, um, the importance of this being an interdisciplinary team. And I know it's not part of any curriculum at PSU cause you don't have an aerospace curriculum right, right now, but it's more of an interdisciplinary team, uh, that, uh, long <laughs> set of descriptions that you, that you had at the beginning. Uh, yeah. How do you view that as a as as important to the educational process that you're doing something like that as opposed to having something built into a curriculum that you have students that are that are working uh, basically for class, so they have to do it. <laughs> right. Okay. So th so this is like you know. Okay. Let's now let's spend the next hour letting listening to Andrew rant about engineering education. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so. I'm an electrical engineering professor, so I have to teach, but I'm a fake professor, I'm just adjunct. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not like Dr. Corner. Uh, so I, um, I have to teach electrical engineering and I only have you know four or five years to teach you electrical engineering. So I really have to focus all my class on electrical engineering. The problem is when you get out into the real world, you are very likely not gonna be on a team of electrical engineers. You are very likely going to be with a mechanical engineer and a computer science and you're going to be on this interdisciplinary team because that's how it works, right? You don't just build a little circuit on a breadboard and hand it off to production, right? You work with mechanical engineers to put it in a package of computer science people to write this, the user interface. And the real world is interdisciplinary. 
And I don't think we do a good enough job teaching this interdisciplinary stuff. So the Pro State Aerospace Society, its job is to create better students through interdisciplinary engineering. So by the time our students graduate, the, you know, the electrical engineers have fought with mechanical engineers for space and power, and, and everybody's yelled at the computer science people who want to run a big processor in space that nobody can afford. And, you know, and they understand these system level trade-offs that are really interesting and important to understand when you're on these kind of teams and working in, you know, in, in the real world for, for a company. Um, and I think we should be teaching more of this interdisciplinary stuff, but it's really hard to teach. And so, so it comes well in this aerospace project where you really have to be interdisciplinary. There, we don't have enough volume in that CubeSat to, to be sloppy, right? We have to make things tight and, and efficient, and we have to be power efficient, and we have to be lightweight, and we have to have computational horsepower to do the image processing. So it's a really good, hard problem to teach people working together. And, and the business students, right? So who's really bad at organizational management? Engineering students. <laughs> and so we have the business students come in and help manage and, and help organize and things like that. And they turn out to be great. Uh, and so there's, again, interdisciplinary wise, you know, you want to get these kinds of experiences before you leave college so that you know what the real world is. Because the real world is very much not like college. You need college and you need the theory and you need the, the, the fundamentals that we give you you really want to get that real world experience. That's why internships and, and NECOPs and other kinds of things like that are so good. Or get involved in a student project where you have to build something with other engineers. And, and I will definitely agree with that on, on my end. That's why we have the various research projects that we, that we do here is to give people, even after they've gotten through my physics classes or my engineering classes, give them some hands-on stuff to work with. Uh, to work with. And I know we're working on sort of designing one of those ground station kits for uh, around here for ORSAT. So we're trying to tie into some of the stuff that you guys are working on as well. Uh, actually, I had a, had a question from one of my students that was asking about the infrared camera on, on ORSAT-1. Uh, how is the infrared camera uh, designed to be able to detect the, the Cirrus cloud distributions that you talked about? Science. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So uh, I I only know a little bit, so I'll I'll try and say it. Uh, so the uh, we get the full spectrum of the solar spectrum coming in, and it hits the top of the cirrus clouds, and then the cirrus the uh, cirrus clouds are ice crystals, and so they uh, reflect the light, but they reflect it in certain ways and in certain bands. And we're looking at like 900 nanometers, 1.5 microns, and maybe 1.38 microns. We're looking at those three IR bands, and we're looking for the reflection of these ice crystals at 12 kilometers back at us from the sun. So the sun will be behind us, and we're looking for the sort of direct reflection from these ice crystals. And we have a real problem, because if you look down on snow, you might expect to get the same kind of a reflection. And so we're looking for a very specific pattern. I do not know exactly what the pattern is, but what we're doing is we've got these, we, we not only have the three filter bands, but we also have polarization bands. And then we sweep the sensor across the, the globe. And as we do that, we kind of, what's called a push broom, we, we get a big strip of the ground segment in all three um, bands and all polarities. And from that, we hope to be able to extract the high altitude clouds. Regular clouds will um, don't have ice crystals in them necessarily, or they've got so much so much higher moisture that they'll observe they'll I'm sorry absorb the bands they're looking at. Only ice crystals should reflect the bands, and then because they're ice crystals, apparently they change the polarization slightly. So again, I say science because this is what the UCL and UMBC. Uh, uh, investigators are helping us with. They're going to do all the heavy lifting with us, and they're helping us build the science instrument. Uh, un understandable. It's all. There are so many other projects that are going on with just within just within the systems that are with, within the satellite that it's impossible to know everything about everything. So uh, we we, yeah, we do right. appreciate. I'm going to check for check one last time for more questions. Um, we actually had one. Um, uh, 
Jake also also asked about uh, he went and looked up the von Karman line because because you mentioned you mentioned it earlier and was just interested to know um, if the line had anything to do with the height at which a plane can no longer actually achieve lift. <laughs> so he was trying to answer the five the the five hundred bonus point question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the cute way to say it is if you have an airplane, the higher you go, the less air there is. So the faster you have to fly to generate lift. And von Karman chose 100 kilometers because at like 98 kilometers ish, you have to fly so fast that you might as well be in orbit because you're going at orbital speeds. And so right where that balance is right around 100 kilometers. And so that was the edge of space. You, you can't really you're, you're as much flying as you're in orbit at 100 kilometers. All right. Well, Andrew, um, thank you very much for all of this. Of course, we're going to have to have you back when we get all the after ORSAT goes up and we get and we get some of the some of the data from all of the very various experiments. Assuming, and we will continue to knock on wood and and cross our fingers and everything else that things don't burn up in space. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we do understand that that is a very real possibility. <laughs> Uh, we do appreciate it. Basically, Hopefully, sure. next time we can have you, we can have you come visit our new science building and, and give a lecture in there. I'd love to do that. Actually, that'd be really fun. Right, so uh, let's let's plan on that. I'll I'll bring Orsat data and a couple models of Orsat actually, and and some physical stuff to play with, and and then at the new science building next time around. Hey, we're we're scientists and engineers. We like toys, so we'll do, so models always work. Um, Appreciate everyone for, for joining us today. Our next physics and astronomy lecture uh, will be um, on Thursday, February 3rd. Uh, you'll un the, the guest speaker for that one happens to be me. So we'll be talking a little bit about, about some NASA history that ties into Coos Bay and remembering uh, the achievements of the Apollo 14 mission. Uh, one of the astronauts from that mission actually uh, considers Coos Bay home. Uh, so, so we'll be looking back at Apollo 14 and looking forward at what the previous lunar missions can tell us in preparation for the Artemis projects and the Artemis missions that are coming in the, in the uh, coming years. Uh, again, that'll be Thursday, February 3rd at 6.30. That one will actually be in person here at the college um, in our science uh, in our new health and science building, um, uh, conditions permitting. Uh, and we hope to see you guys may, uh, make the voyage over here. Um, we look forward to having everybody come visit. If you're interested in these um, physics and astronomy lecture series continuing, one of the best ways to do that is to reach out to the Southwestern Oregon uh, uh, Community College Foundation. Um, any donations to the foundation that are that are mentioned uh, to support the lecture series um, can definitely will be definitely applied to that, whether it be for speaker travel or for promotion promotion of of future events. We encourage we encourage anyone that's interested to do that. Um, also, keep an eye on all of our projects that are currently ongoing through our Facebook page at. Uh, Southwestern Oregon Physics and Engineering and through the website at physics.socc.edu. Um, and if you're interested in participating, always reach out to, you can reach out to me at aaron.coiner at socc.edu or uh, send us an email to physics-engineering uh, at socc.edu and uh, either myself or our collaborator, Crystal Hopper, will respond and uh, get you connected to the program that you want to work with. And with that, we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you again for joining us. <laughs>